So welcome again, and welcome to Public Art Bootcamp Online, talking today about implementation and long-term life of artwork in, pub of artwork in public art. Um, today we have three esteemed presenters that will be taking us through different topics, all pointed towards this overall topic. Um, we're excited to present this today and excited to have this recorded and available on our website and on our YouTube channel following. Next slide. The, present, the presentations will be um, by our esteemed panelists today, um, and all attendees will be able to use the Q&A function to submit questions. Um, you can submit questions throughout the presentation that the project managers here can answer as we can, and then at the end, we'll be reading aloud questions to the individual presenters. If you do have a specific question for an, a specific presenter, please just note that in your question, so we'll be able to address that direct that question directly to that individual. Next slide, please. Great. So, as part of our overall presentation today, we are starting with Tiffany Hedrick. Tiffany has been a part of the Office of Arts and Culture, and it as the conservator and all things maintenance for our public art collection. So responsible for over 400 pieces of public art within the city of Seattle. Um, very busy, very much expert in her field and really excited for her to be able to share some of her um, years of knowledge and expertise in this very important topic. Tiffany. Good morning, thanks Maya. I'm happy to be here. And um, yes, I've got some experience with maintenance for the collection and conservation. So I'm going to touch on a couple of different items. I want to say welcome to all the boot campers. And we will probably start with documentation, a little bit about what we need to help maintain and uh, conserve your art in the future if anything comes up. Uh, so documentation comes up a lot. And one of the things that we'd really like to push is to uh, get some really critical uh, expl explicit sort of practices when it comes to getting documentation. A lot of times uh, artists are at the end of their project, so it feels like documentation um, is kind of the last push. And what we'd really like to see are some really specific outlines so that we can do our best to maintain the artwork for well into the future. So everything that I've listed here are things that we really need, um, and I'll try to explain a little bit about why. But when you're listing materials, and one thing that might be helpful too is to kind of work on this documentation as you go along so that when you're at the end of your project and you're ready uh, with your final deliverables and uh, documents that you need to submit, that they're sort of already ready and in practice. So a lot of times we will get uh, material questions that come up, but if you're purchasing materials, if you can tell us what, when, and where you purchased from, and be as explicit as possible, uh, right down to sort of paint specifications, that kind of thing. Um, methods of fabrication, assembly, installation, and reversibility, which we will talk a little bit more about later, are very helpful for us uh, down the road. and. You can get some of those documents from your, obviously, from your fabricators and installation folks. Uh, but when you're doing your own fabrication work and assembly, if you can be as explicit as possible about those things, it would be really helpful. Um, specifications should include electrical fabrication, engineering, hardware, finish, and as built. And we've got a little terminology at the end. So if you have any questions, we can review that. Uh, but uh, the more that you can provide us, uh, the better we can maintain your original aesthetic. Software, hardware, and programming for multimedia works is really critical for us, especially uh, if there are um, some very one-off uh, installations and new ideas that you're working with or programming techniques. Um, so if you can also include duplicates uh, on some type of additional hard drive, that kind of thing, that would really help us down the road in any kind of event of failure, whether it's on the facility end of things or um, just you know physical. Uh, warranties, very critical, uh, especially if you can have them signed by, if you're able to get warranties from your contractors or your suppliers or for parts, finishes, uh, have them signed by the company and uh, be sure to get us a copy if you could. And then maintenance details. Um, Frequency, 
uh, that you might like to see maintenance or you have expectations for frequency uh, exceptions alterations that you might be willing to see down the road if we need to and reversibility which again we'll talk more about but um, and then a state chain of command is important because people do move uh, records sometimes go missing so if you have folks that are in charge of your estate um, much like you might have a beneficiary please be sure to list those things with contact information so that we can reach you um, in the event we want to do some conservation or restoration work we'll be able to consult you on that next slide please next slide please yeah thanks uh longevity so our expectation for permanently cited public artworks is about 20 years uh, for multimedia works we like to assume at least a five-year functional lifespan. Um, mechanical components uh, may vary by project. So those are sort of explicitly reviewed. Um, and basically what we do, we try to conduct annual inspections of the entire collection and maintenance can be periodic. So uh, that's not always steadfast, but uh, with a growing collection, we have routine maintenance that we anticipate maybe every three to five years on average, and major maintenance or conservation generally occurs every seven to 10 years. Um, obviously that varies by project greatly, but um, life cycle assessment is something that, that comes up and that will also depend on the project. But if it's determined that an artwork can't be maintained because we have budget constraints or there is some obsolescence of components, then your work could become a candidate for de-exception <laughs> from the collection, uh, which we, of course, do not want to do. So uh, what this really means for artists is that the more sustainable the work that you can create, uh, the longer it will remain in the collection for future generations and part of your portfolio and the narrative that shapes the community. Next slide. So we have some expectations for the artist and the foremost being safety for the public and the environment. Um, and some of those things include uh, if you're installing an artwork that is either on the ground plane, um, part of a uh, permanent collection that's either in ground or has components that may be on a walking surface, you need to include permanent non-slip surface treatment specifications for us so that we can ensure that that work uh, remains not a liability for safety. Um, moving parts should be out of reach of the public, which means at a height or distance that is uh, significantly safe for or without interaction. Uh, sharp edges, pinch points, catch points, uh, constricted cavities are generally not appropriate, and particularly where there's a high level of interaction. Uh, if you can allow maintenance, like the sufficient, sorry, sufficient space on all sides of your installation for equipment and maintenance access in the event we have to do a deinstallation down the road, uh, that would be wonderful. So graffiti elements that are susceptible to vandalism, I'm sorry, design elements should be improved. And we can talk more about that, but graffiti removal methods should also be included as part of your deliverables. Uh, you should research ADA requirements for your site and design accordingly so that we can ensure accessibility for our uh, friends and neighbors that have those uh, requirements. And then artwork that uh, is either obstructing visibility in some way to cyclists, pedestrians, or vehicular traffic should also be reconsidered. Next slide. So you can integrate sustainable practices in some small but impactful ways with your work. Um, and one of the things I like to tell folks is that if you can, if you're experimenting and sourcing new products and materials, one of the things that is great to do is to request samples from suppliers and manufacturers. And that way you sort of avoid accumulating a number of products that may not meet your expectations. So you can avoid disposal <coughs> by testing some smaller samples until you're really happy with a product. Uh, source companies that maintain a commitment to recycling, pollution, or water uh, protection you can consider distances when you're ordering materials. Purchasing from local suppliers supports other artists and local businesses, but it can also reduce costs overall carbon emissions. 
uh, when you're doing installation, you can utilize electric versus gas powered equipment for installations. That's something that you can request. Uh, source eco friendly materials or substitutions. <coughs> and then weigh options for alternative materials that are naturally graffiti resistant or have no monetary value if they're stolen or vandalized. Next slide. So, some considerations for site specific artworks. Uh, that are just good practice to think about when, uh, depending on your site, is that you should consider how the site will affect how your work is maintained. Um, some sites uh, contain natural habitats, landscaping, bodies of water, or playgrounds or play areas that can affect the types of materials and processes that we use and that are employed in conservation of your work. So, if you have a site that is sensitive location, uh, source environmentally responsible materials as much as possible and outlining uh, maintenance procedures for these types of locations can really help you think through the process of how we might maintain it in the event that uh, we need to do some major maintenance or conservation in the future. Um, utilizing the natural environment to enhance your design is another way uh, because uh, there are a lot of different uh, interactive elements that kind of play into the focus of a design, pathways, water features, and plazas, for example. So if you consider how landscape areas and traffic flow can be affected by your work, and again, incorporate safety and accessibility into your designs, also evaluate how your materials will interact with the site features and the environment. So that's one thing that's uh, important to consider is your surface coatings, and we'll get into that more, but um, next slide, please. Uh, so, fabrication can basically be broken into two main categories, which is sort of architectural, aesthetic, or artistic, uh, sort of generally and broadly railings, fencing, sheet metal, uh, or then there's structural, which is foundation, support, structures, and armatures. So one thing that can help with your project and maybe your budget is to source fabricators that have multiple capabilities um, as needed so you can consolidate vendor support and reduce overall costs. Uh, fabricators with design proficiencies can also offer solutions in the initial design phase uh, for potential problems and also advise on reversibility techniques. Next slide. And here's a couple of fabrication recommendations I like to make for people that um, may not have worked with a fabricator before. Uh, one is to be sure to check references, talk with fellow artists, your project managers, and and be you know feel free to check um, references of including engineers and potential contractors to see if those folks are are uh, a good fit for your project. Um, and during the initial phase of a project, if you develop a list of additional contractors, uh, products, and materials to fall back on in the event you run into any issues or your performance expectations aren't met, then you will already be ahead of the game because you can just sort of fall back. It's also good to check timelines when you're working with fabricators um, and allow plenty of lead time to guarantee uh, your deadlines can be met for the project. And then I also tell folks to carefully research materials and processes that might be proposed to you uh, independently so that you can ensure accuracy of the information you've been provided. Next slide. So the unexpected, this is sort of where uh, reversibility uh, considerations are important for us in maintaining your work. Um, agents of deterioration can come in all forms. These three examples I listed are actually specific from issues that I've encountered in the past with the collection. And uh, it, it happens on a broad range of materials, but the idea essentially is that the more reversible your work, the easier it is that when we do encounter an issue, we're able to resolve the problem and again, maintain the original aesthetic. Next slide, please. So here are some ideas about how you can uh, add reversibility into your design. And again, back to the idea of allowing plenty of space for access. So if you can ensure that internal spaces 
uh, hardware attachment points, lighting, media elements that you may have are sufficiently accessible for tools, equipment, and staff. That's really important um, in making sure that we are able to access everything without having to deconstruct the work. Uh, reduce the scale of components if necessary. You can create additional smaller elements and minimize weight to allow for more simplified deconstruction. Also incorporate disassembly methods by designing your elements to be very easily replaced. Um, fewer hardware, you know, smaller components, again, those are all things that are very helpful to us if we ever have to deinstall the work for uh, restoration purposes. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about individual material considerations. I won't be able to cover everything. Uh, plastic and electrical is a, its own sort of categories that could take easily the entire time. So I have left some things out, but remember that we're always here to consult with you. So just remember that when whatever the material and media that you're working in, uh, understanding how those materials interact with each other and the environment is critical for a superior life expectancy for your project. Uh, when researching materials, definitely contact experts in the field and be sure that you're getting the most updated and current knowledge. Um, request information from a variety of sources and compare notes so that you know that you're sort of up to date with what your, you know, the information is up to date that you're receiving. Uh, you can look to manufacturers or suppliers that have extensive industry knowledge. And there's a few ways that you can uh, maybe, I guess, determine if you're dealing with an industry expert. A lot of uh, manufacturers, fabricators, that kind of thing, if they are willing to, uh, for example, make a site visit, they ask specifically for a site visit before they're able to give you any proposals. That's very critical and, and, and sort of signifies that they uh, have been in the field for a long time and understand that those importance are uh, those the importance of the site visit to fully understand the project. Uh, if you are if they are offering warranties, for example, on products, that's a good indication that they have confidence in the uh, material or uh, if they're offering a warranty as well. And then inquire about quantities of supplies that might be available for future needs um, to avoid obsolescence. Uh, particularly critical with multimedia works. And then whenever possible, of course, buy from local suppliers, which not only supports the local economy, but also allows site visits to verify quality as opposed to ordering from long distances. Uh, it ensures acclimation of some organic materials if you're working in that media, and it reduces risk of damage or extensive delays um, that can occur with long distance transport, for example. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about metals quickly. Uh, obviously, compatibility is critical for mixed metal constructions to avoid galvanic corrosion. So when you're joining any dissimilar metals with your projects, uh, please consider how environmental conditions will also affect the materials. Uh, research isolation materials. This is very critical and explore innovative solutions. So if you can reach out to specialists uh, and fabricators and talk to them extensively about how you can avoid that in uh, early stages of your project, uh, then you uh, won't have any unexpected aesthetic down the road. Some metal theft is an ongoing concern uh, that could affect your artwork. So if you can incorporate some mitigation methods into your design, which might include increasing thickness in narrow or thin gauge areas that could sort of be easily sawn through, um, install interior armatures to reinforce strength under the design. Now, this would be separate from your support structure, but uh, could be an addition. Also, incorporate design aesthetics that allow for reversibility and replacement and, and uh, mechanically secure external components to substructures. Next slide. Um, stone is a Material that seems very durable, but sourcing for replacement can be difficult depending on the variety uh, and availability and also expensive depending on the source location. Uh, some prohibitive shipping costs and challenging logistics company stone projects and ordering and then uh, material selection is also going to be dictated by the site environment. Next slide. 
Um, so we do accept wood on some case-by-case uh, -case basis, and it can be a great lasting material, but bio uh, deteriorate or degradation is, is the most significant concern for components made from wood. Uh, pest infestation that can lead to multiple uh, issues with wood, biological attack because uh, it's very susceptible to you know, fungi and biological growth that can permanently damage surfaces. Water infiltration obviously leads to rot decomposition. Uh, so if you're going to work in wood, be sure that you select species that are naturally resistant to biological growth. Uh, Western red cedar uh, contains compounds that are nat naturally antibacterial. And it's also critical when you're working with wood to consider allowing appropriate uh, cure times so that you can avoid warping, cracking, and checks that occur. Uh, air dried lumber is generally preferred for exterior applications. And you can, there are a lot of composite materials uh, that are also you know, acceptable for our collection and have a very great longevity, uh, such as EPA, which is comparable in cost to a lot of composites. Uh, that's just something that is a natural wood, but is also something to keep in mind. So you'll have to do your research when it comes to all of these materials, but these are just some things to keep in mind. The collection does require that wood should be treated with appropriate preservatives only and uh, natural silics 100 is one thing that we like to recommend. Next slide. Uh, for glass, there are a few considerations and it's also a broad uh, material category. So if you are working in uh, an application that has a lot of public interaction, uh, safety glass will be required. Laminated glass is a thermal plastic and we prefer that it is EVA for uh, inner layers where it's going to be adhered in many different um, layers. Uh, it's also waterproof, which uh, reduces some concerns over infiltration in frameless applications. Dichroic glass, if that is something you're going to incorporate in your design, really needs to be annealed as a second surface. And a neon also has great longevity, but system requirements and troubleshooting challenges, also some shortages can restrict creative options. Next slide. Um, some hardware suggestions to keep in mind are, if you can stay with one unit of measurement, uh, that should say, <clears throat> excuse me, SAE, which is just sort of your standard, that uh, stands for automotive uh, engineers, and then there's metric, but it doesn't matter which one you use. Just try to stick with uh, one throughout the project. It make, makes it a lot easier for us for maintenance and facilities folks that may be doing maintenance in the future. Um, and for security hardware, there's a wide variety of tamper proof hardware available. Uh, but hex pins are security screws and bolts that we prefer. And if you can use or source hardened materials, which uh, are just higher strength or higher grade. So isolation materials, and that's uh, typically involved with uh, back to metal where you want to have um, corrosion resistance. Uh, the, the general consensus on isolation materials bro uh, is broadly varied throughout the industry. Um, so really, if you, if you can try to stay with the same metals throughout your installation, and if you cannot, then uh, be prepared to do um, significant amount of research for isolation materials, but your fabricators, engineers, um, and metallurgists are also great resources that can help with that. Um, and for installation, be sure that you add plenty, allow plenty of room for expansion and contraction of materials around your hardware. Um, and that that's true for most materials, including plastics, wood, metal, and then reversibility. If you can coat your hardware with anti seize. Uh, that will will help us with uh, disassembly if ever required in the future. Next slide. So a quick word about protective coatings because I get a lot of questions about powder coating. So I wanted to include just a brief uh, introduction on some of the differences and you can refer back to this as needed. So uh, there's a lot of different examples of protective coating just broadly is, is uh, you know, any material that prevents degradation of the base material. Next slide. Um, and then finishes is, is simply can apply to paint or uh, surface uh, metal treatments and talk a little bit more about it. And if there's questions, uh, but these are the general sort of some general applications. Next slide. And this is just a quick 
uh, definition of powder coat technology, again, because I get a lot of questions about it to just kind of differentiate for folks. Um, it's a coating that's a dry powder, obviously. A lot of people are familiar with it, but uh, there seems to be some, um, a lot of questions about which is the right application for your project. So we're happy to talk to that more later. Next slide. I listed a couple of pros and cons as well for powder coating so that you could do a bit of a comparison when you're thinking about what type of coating if you want to incorporate paint into your design. Um, so there's the differences are durability, environmental, and, and, and uh, you know, expense. Um, and so you'll have to weigh those options with your project to determine uh, which really fits your needs best. But it uh, will obviously depend on your site. Uh, the type of finish that you're trying to uh, achieve and exposure levels. Next slide. And again, there's some limitations regarding the size of your project and whether there are options for that. Um, variable thickness of how many how many mills you'll want to achieve on your surface. Um, again, some types of powder coating. Uh, you know, really not suitable for on site works, especially if the work is a little bit remote. Um, it's very difficult to touch up surfaces and there's a lot to it. So these are just some questions again that you can refer back to if you have questions about uh, color consistency. So powder coating, for example, is uh, great because it, it, there's a collection of reuse of, of non adhered powder. So it's environmentally really a great process, uh, but it can be difficult to achieve a precise color match, for example. Next slide, please. Um, electrostatic is uh, exclusive to metal substrates. It's not something that's typically, uh, you know, it can be very expensive and cost prohibitive. It only applies with wet paint, but I included a couple of pros and cons here that you can review so that you understand kind of what your limitations might be. For example, with color options, uh, typically it runs about $300 a gallon for materials, but a lot of a lot of questions come in about the difference between these types of processes. So I wanted to include a couple of these um, options. It's also the only sort of process that can be applied on site where there's minimal masking and no overspray. And again, we can refer back to this in the Q and A. Um, next slide. And then wet paints are the typical paints everyone sort of familiar with. Um, also, a couple of pros and cons that I listed, just so that there's a little bit of an understanding. I think typically folks tend to overlook wet paints because they um, they don't seem as durable, which can be true, uh, but they are also very easy to touch up. And so there's sometimes uh, a sort of equal longevity that can occur with wet paints versus powder coat. Next slide, please. And just a word about graffiti. Uh, obviously, it's something that, that we deal with a lot in the city's collection, and we do try to respond to graffiti um, issues and uh, reports within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but graffiti is really damaging to artwork surfaces. So we, uh, we really want to do our best to mitigate solutions. And um, if you can really incorporate some graffiti mitigation considerations into your initial design. It will be very helpful for us in maintaining your original aesthetic in the future. Um, ghosting, for example, is something that can permanently damage particular surfaces such as stone and masonry. Um, and so these are these are some uh, some considerations. There's uh, next slide, please. A lot of different options for anti graffiti coatings for all materials. Also, some natural protective surface coatings that are available that people may not consider in that category, but such as waxes over metal um, and wood preservatives all act as anti graffiti and help us maintain the artworks. Um, non sacrificial coatings are generally not accepted, um, except on a case by case basis for the collection. Next slide. And uh, how we can help assist uh, just project reviews, material sourcing and suggestions, um, specialized vendor referral. We'd love to be able to review your maintenance procedures and uh, site and facility liaison if needed. And I think that's the last slide. 
a few terminology for you, a couple of terms that you may be unfamiliar with. So again, I look forward to answering questions in the QA. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Tiffany, for that masterclass on materiality and conservation and maintenance. So really appreciate it. And so glad to have this be recorded to be able to re-reference all those great all that great information. Um, next up, I wanted to introduce Horatio Law. Um, a lot of what we just learned about of like um, best laid plans and um, all the planning that goes into the development of a public artwork. To shift that focus into kind of a few real world case study examples um, that Horatio is going to share with us today. Um, Horatio is a Portland art. Portland art based artist who I've had the pleasure with working with for the current project, the AIDS Memorial Pathway, um, and also just familiar with his artistic career over the past five or so years and really watched it grow and expand, um, as well as really using a lot of different types of materials in the different artwork that he has created. Um, and so um, the knowledge of using the variety of materials and methods, as well as um, being able to reflect back to some of the things that do happen up to public artwork in the public sphere. And with that, welcome Horatio Law. Hi, uh, Maya, do I have 20 minutes for this presentation? Yes. Okay, I'll stick to that. All right, next slide, please. Well, a lot of the uh, issue about maintenance and conservation has been touched on by uh, Tiffany, but I will go through it really quickly. Uh, but in my in the artist point of view, when I approaching those issues, so first of all, know the materials, and sometimes you doing something new, you can learn it from uh, working with structural engineer and your fabricator and be ready to consider alternative method and uh, material uh, in terms of fabrication process. Uh, second, consult with uh, the conservator like Tiffany uh, for the Office of Art and Culture. And also you can uh, hire a consultant uh, like a restorer uh, to uh, anticipating any potential issues. A restorer will be able to tell you what kind of issue they have seen over the years and and can advise on suitability and longevity of material as well. And thirdly, uh, understanding your maintenance uh, issues, uh, where, who, what, and when. Uh, the next slide will ask those questions. Where, uh, so know about what the location where your artwork is going to be and proximity to uh, um, the audience, uh, to environment, and so you can judge for yourself how you build your art. Uh, who, uh, one is who is your audience? It's always important as an artist. Uh, you need to know, um, uh, especially public art, your audience is different than the gallery uh, audience, as you all know. And um, also who will maintain your work as well? Um, what, uh, what need to be done for regular maintenance? Uh, and Tiffany had touched on a lot of that. Uh, one project I have with multimedia material, uh, it was offered to me a five year service contract from the designer of the uh, software. And I didn't have the budget to pay for it back then, but I wish I had because that would simplify things a lot. And then when it's about how often your work needs to be serviced and maintained, uh, all that uh, is touched on by Tiffany already. Um, uh, next slide, please. The other concern I have is um, when you go about creating, your, uh, thinking about your art pieces, um, think, think about whether your materials uh, embody, uh, amplify your idea. Often when we do public art, we are kind of really have a limited range of material we can work from. But within those range, you can find material that can uh, speak to your idea and concept as well. Uh, secondly, um, know your stakeholders and see you can find ways for them to buy into your project because once you make the project, it's up to the community to, and also the agency to, to maintain it. But it's really important to the community that you work for, that you create art for, 
uh, have a buy-in that they really connected with your art piece. And third, um, how would this project or this material help to grow your portfolio? Um, when I first started doing public art, uh, my mentor, uh, uh, um, Nanda D'Agostino, I always said that she will try something new in each project as a way of personal growth and artistic growth, um, but also uh, in a way to broaden your um, uh, your portfolio that you can deal with different materials and different setting as well. So I'm conscious about what kind of project I'm applying to. Uh, I try to get a project within like public transit, uh, private space, a public space, outdoor space, indoor space, just to show a range of your uh, ability to deal with different setting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the projects I'm gonna talk about is one of my first projects in Seattle for the Asian Counseling and Referral Service. And um, it's called Gilded Bow Column. Um, next slide. Uh, it's a, a three-story, 16-foot structure, um, about uh, five foot in, let's see, five, six foot in diameter, uh, has 190 uh, ceramic bowls. And the inside of the bowls were gilded with gold glaze. And the outside, uh, we do uh, next slide. The outside is a uh, 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 Glazed by the individuals in the organization, and we uh, have these um, glazing workshop with the people connected with the organization. But one of the thing I want to point out is that originally this design was uh, planned on using commercially available and decorated uh, ceramic bowls. However, uh, in my search for material, I couldn't find the kind of right size and shape that is uh, right for uh, this project. So I decided to have each of these bowl uh, custom cast. And um, so, you know, circumstance and also uh, 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 <clears throat> um, availability uh, dictate, sometimes dictate your material and the way to uh, fabricate your piece. So in this case, I'm uh, uh, faced with the, uh, could be uh, uh, obstacle in the sense that uh, once I custom cast it and I have to glaze it, all of them. Uh, so in thinking of, through that process, I decided to open up the glazing to the community so that the, each community member can come in and create their own bowl. So, so in that changing in shifting uh, the material and, and, and product and uh, I also broadened the, the appeal to the community and, and become more inclusive because everybody have a stake in making this one and become part of it. Uh, this has all happened spontaneously. And uh, so the, the, well, your design process doesn't end at the design phase and something you can look at it as a force to change because of various circumstances, but you can also look at it as a, a creative opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, th these are the community members who are uh, who showed up to help decorate the piece. Next, as you can see, we have a range of ages and also uh, different people, clients, and families and staff are all part of it. Next, please. Uh, another way to uh, perpetuate uh, your work, besides being the physical structure is to document it. And in this case, we document every single bowl and uh, photograph and put it in the picture book. Next, please. And this is the final outcome in between floors. Uh, it become a place where people gather and point to the bowls that they may uh, or talk to visitor, the process and connect with each other because when they decorate the bowls, they also talk about the story that goes into the decoration, the history, the, what, what did they uh, depict? And a lot of them were uh, immigrants. So they have immigrant history and they have uh, um, textures and design from different culture that brought into the place. Next, please. A next piece is uh, 
we have a very small space in the Oregon State Hospital in Salem, Oregon. This is the, um, the mental hospital in, uh, in a state hospital in Oregon. And uh, next slide. Uh, I was given this a uh, small uh, enclave uh, space to create a public art piece, both for the patient and for the staff and visitors. This is just outside the hospital, uh, but in still kind of a more restricted area. So basically we have some bench and a couple of seats. Next, please. Uh, this is what we make of it. I, I decided to treat that place as uh, like a beehive and have a series of uh, cast resin boxes uh, that contain artwork that we make by the uh, patients. Next, please. I started out with using uh, fabric material that I was told that mental patient will uh, uh, will have an easy connection with, and then we changed the pattern into paper, and we did origami workshop with the patients. So the origamis were made by the patient. Next, please. And uh, the the creative team, I have a team of artists working with me. Uh, we're able to uh, organize and arrange these uh, origami and they, so there is a collaboration between the artist and the patients and put these into these uh, uh, resin boxes. Next, please. We also collected uh, drawings uh, on iPad uh, in a video form that then recreate uh, the patient's way of drawing and we put it all in one video screen. Next. We also collect uh, the patients uh, performing in front of a light uh, uh, and, and casting shadow. Uh, next, please. And using the shadow, the, the color paper and, the, and uh, uh, the drawing gesture, we recreate the patient's uh, portrait that way. Uh, if you use the next uh, slide. Thing is a video. So as you can see, there's a self three video screen. All the resin box have LED lights, and um, there's a um, motion sensor that, when there is no one in the space, the LED lights in the boxes were just pulsing like, like a heartbeat. But as soon as there's someone in the space and wherever that person is facing, um, the light box uh, light up instead of pulsing. So you can see the, uh, the arrangement of the origami very clearly. So all these involve very complicated, for some people maybe pretty simple, but for me it's complicated software. And uh, I, will have, I have a software firm help me design this motion sensor activated light uh, series. So uh, naturally there is lots of glitches and uh, we, within the first year we have required the company to come in at least five times to fix um, whatever glitches come out. And that seems to be very regular. Uh, so when you looking at multimedia work, that is something they need to be uh, considering. That's why I thought about if I have enough money for the uh, service contract, I would have done it. Um, and that will at least keep my peace for five years, um, you know, running uh, trouble free. But last I heard, uh, and I heard from people who worked in the hospital that they're still working and they really still enjoying the pieces. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this piece is with the uh, light rail um, in Portland, we call TriMet. It's a series of uh, ser um, concrete and steel uh, relief mural uh, on the underpass of the train overpass on both sides of the freeway as the train pass over. And they are made out of bicycle parts that look like um, 
um, dinosaur skeleton. Yes, next slide, please. Um, the bicycle parts were collected in the neighborhood, bike shops, clean, and then next. And then we uh, put it together in space and then we wired up in steel frames. Uh, well, pieces were clean and also powder coated. And then um, we uh, pour this color concrete uh, over it. And then this is what happened when I went visited the last time. Uh, keep going, yes. Uh, next, please. And next. So um, I was told by the, my connection to TriMed that they actually stopped cleaning and removing graffiti until everything settled down. So this is what it's gonna look like for a while. But this piece was designed for that kind of environment. So when I was choosing material, I was choosing the very, very uh, uh, tough and rough kind of material with concrete and also um, uh, stainless steel uh, powder coated um, um, uh, material. So it will be cleaned up pretty easily. I'm not sure about the ghosting, whether that will still happen or not, but it's all figured into the design that I actually wouldn't mind to have this kind of texture added to the piece. Um, the last piece is called Ribbon of Light. It's the piece I'm currently working on at the ACE uh, Memorial Pathway in Seattle. Um, next. Uh, the idea come out from um, looking at rocks and um, laminated glass and stacked glass. Next. Uh, these are the design that was drawing and uh, I decided to use glass because the material sort of had the ability to reflect what I was thinking about. Uh, the laminating of these glass pieces sort of remind me of those uh, very old rocks that I show you in early on. Uh, next, please. Uh, with this piece also come with uh, a designed uh, pathway and um, the artwork were placed into three different station. Next. Uh, this is the first station. Uh, it's a vertical laminated glass piece. Second station, uh, next one. Second station is three uh, stack uh, glass. These are a little bit different than the first station. And the third station is the lambda shape piece. It's also uh, laminated glass. Uh, the glass also have words on them, sandblast, next one. Uh, yeah, the sandblast or, or in inner layers, the overall, all pieces were all sandblasted to achieve a frosted finish. Uh, next, please. Next, please. So uh, it was this this one piece in particular that was giving me a lot of problem because in fabrication, uh, having this is happening about each one of them has 30 layers of lamination which become really uh, expensive and also difficult to do. Uh, we actually couldn't find anyone in the state to do it with the um, budget that I have. So these pieces are uh, gonna be fa manufactured and fabricated in Germany and shipped over here. And of course, with all the drawback that Tiffany had mentioned about time and then uh, I'm not able to local source and all those things, but this is the, how I can afford it. Uh, so with this piece, originally I proposed as a lamination pieces. Uh, however, this company that I work with have an, have other ideas uh, first uh, to cut down course cost and also uh, in an effort to make it easier to maintain. Uh, next, please. So they have two suge suggestion. One on the left is uh, dry stacking these glass pieces with two dowels as a registration on the left side. You see the two vertical uh, line that come up and, and then that's the registration uh, rods. And then you cap off with six layer of laminated uh, glass. Uh, however, uh, the, the drawback is the top layer, it just basically just lay on top of the piece. 
uh, with just something sticky to keep it uh, so that it doesn't fall off. Uh, in the interior environment and with closely guarded, that will work very well. The second option is a uh, totally dry stack on the right-hand side. Everything is dry stack all the way through uh, with two um, uh, metal dowels, again, as registration and with a uh, um, temper three lock on top so that it will keep in place. Um, uh, one of the things about dry stacking and is that uh, it might sound very uh, perilous, but uh, in terms of repair wise, if any pieces were been cracked, we could actually uh, take it apart very easily and then replace those broken pieces. And ultimately, we we opt for a, uh, a hybrid uh, solution. Uh, we have a vertical dry stack all the way to the top two layers, and then top two layers uh, it will be laminated to help uh, protect the uh, high impact on the surface. Uh, but it will be um, hang, an uh, anchored down with the screw, uh, temper three screw on top. So these are all things that happen along the way of fabrication that you have to really um, work with the fabricator to find very creative solution uh, to make it work. So I think I'm gonna stop here. Uh, my time is up. Wonderful. Thanks, Horatio, for that overview of your work really showcasing um, different artworks, different materiality and different methods that you use to ensure kind of the long term long term life and um, of those works within the public sphere. Um, next, I'm pleased to introduce Zern Kaler. Um, Zern is a Seattle based artist and photographer um, who has a wide portfolio in art photography, um, as well as portraiture, documentation and storytelling um, and really thrilled for Zorn to be able to share with us today. Um, thank you so much, Maya and Jason and Becky and all the folks. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, uh, photographic documentation. Uh, <laughs> uh, where to start? Why document your work? Why, why are you taking photographs uh, uh, to document this work that you made? Uh, certainly for record keeping. Uh, record keeping is so important and just that little thumbnail uh, next to all of the information that uh, uh, Tiffany said that you should put uh, in part of your record keeping, that little thumbnail makes a big difference because you can actually have a visual representation of what it is these materials constitute. Um, catalog. So uh, you saw uh, uh, in Horatio's uh, presentation uh, 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 the photographs of the bowls in a magazine. So catalog is a lot of times used by galleries um, or museums to showcase the work that is being uh, exhibited. And a catalog can look a variety of ways. It can be as simple as a brochure or it can be as elaborate as Horatio's book. Um, so when you're thinking about that, uh, the quality of the photography that goes into that is, is very important. You might also think about photography for reproduction of your work. And what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that even if you are uh, photographing uh, a sculpture or uh, uh, some other kind of uh, 3D work, you may uh, want to have that reproduced in some fashion, uh, either across social media or as something that you're going to sell as a poster or part of a book. Um, so reproduction is another reason to document your work. Uh, you want to document your work because you are going to be using work samples for grant and other applications if you're applying for funding or if you're applying for residency or you're going to college uh, for graduate studies, uh, all of these institutions or agencies are going to ask you to show your work. So you want to have good uh, uh, photographic documentation of your work. Uh, another reason to document your work is kind of sideways, uh, but it's to tell the story of your process. So in this case, we're talking about photography as a tool to talk about how you did the uh, thing, not necessarily the finished project or product. Uh, and lastly, you want to think about promotion. So uh, social media uh, requires a certain type of uh, uh, photographic promotion, uh, magazines, your website, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, the best way to kind of talk about your work 
in a lot of in a lot of a lot of circumstances is just to show it so people can see it for themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about choosing the best images uh, to showcase your work, right? We're doing this. We're doing this photographic documentation, and you want to think about how do you choose the best interest, images to showcase your work. I would say, uh, first and foremost, the thing that you want to do is make sure that the work that you're choosing uh, represents you currently. Uh, what do I mean by that? I think that I have fantastic work from when I graduated photo school. I don't think any of that work right now, as good as I may think it is, represents me. So I want to think uh, just uh, in that way, is the work that I'm providing uh, to whoever, whoever's looking at my photographs of my work, is that work work that actually represents who I am right now? Uh, this image that you see here and the next image, and we can go to the next slide, are uh, images that I made in 2016, but they still very much talk about my aesthetic, talk about the way I make work, and talk about the messages uh, that I'm trying to convey. So this work still represents me. Uh, as I go forward, I may discover that this work no longer does, and it will fall out of the catalog of images that I'm going to uh, show. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, as a practical consideration, you want to think about uh, if the images you're using uh, represent the art accurately. Um, from a photographic standpoint, when you are reproducing images photographically, you want to make sure that you're being true to the image. So what that means for you is you don't want to enhance it in any way. You're not trying to pop colors. You're not trying to make it look better whatever that means, you know, for the viewer. You're trying to represent the work. Uh, you can think about it in the same way that you think about, like, uh, 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 social dating apps, right? You can see a particular picture, and then you can see the particular person, and you go, wait a minute, those things don't match. Um, it's really, really, really important that uh, the work uh, that you are representing photographically or your photographic representation of that work is accurate to the work. I wanted to point out one thing in this particular slide. You will notice that the outsides of this painting are uh, uh, are just a wall with with a little bit of uh, white and uh, two tones there. This is a particular request of the artist that it not be clipped out and just put on a white surface. That it actually be on this particular surface. So what you're thinking about um, when you're thinking about are the images represented accurately? You're also thinking about not only the color. Um, and the actual image itself, but the situation of the surroundings in which it is photographed. Um, so those are things that you want to kind of think about uh, when you're doing this. I think that I got my slides a little bit out of order. There is a slide that says how, and I have a feeling that it's way down the line. There we are. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Um, so how do you do this, right? Because uh, you're making photographs of this work and you're making photographs that you hope are going to be archival. Uh, if you are on a budget, really any phone uh, or tablet will do, right? Um, you can make it happen. You can start uh, cataloging your work. You can start documenting your work uh, with your phone. Uh, I, me personally, I would certainly uh, suggest finding um, uh, a professional to do your work, uh, not necessarily me, but somebody that can give your work the consideration it needs and can think about things that maybe you didn't think about uh, when documenting work. Having said that, you can do this yourself. You can take your phone. Uh, I would strongly suggest setting it up on a tripod, uh, even a phone, if you're going to shoot with that. Um, but again, you can also kind of figure out different ways to stabilize your phone while you're making this work so that it's still uh, a nice, clear image. Uh, typically, though, we'd use a tripod. Uh, even if you are using a phone, to make sure that the image is still, uh, to make sure that you can um, capture it accurately, right? You don't want blurry, uh, unfocused images. You want really sharp, well-focused images. Uh, a drawback for me for phone is that uh, phones typically store images using JPEG format. You know, JPEG is a great, great format for emailing and sending work. It's horrible as an accurate record. Uh, JPEG, and I, I just wanted to talk about this a little bit uh, in depth, JPEG is what's called a lossy file. It is a file that every time it closes and opens, it throws information away. And you might not notice that 
uh, you know, the first 20 or 30 times that you open and close that file, but eventually you will literally see the degradation of that record. So typically JPEG is not something that you want to use as a file format for storing your photographic record. Um, typically you want to shoot in raw, uh, which is uh, what's known as a lossless uh, file format. Um, it's uh, to me, it's the best format to shoot in uh, just because it provides a lossless unenhanced image file. Uh, you can always convert to JPEG when you're sending your files, but your original uh, is still intact as a lossless raw file or a TIFF file. Um, there's a couple of files here. So uh, we're going to talk about raw, uh, TIFF, and uh, PSD. PSD is a Photoshop document. You may have heard that term before. Um, basically, a PSD is a TIFF file. It's a lossless file. Those are the ways you want to store your photographic record. Um, when you're sending your photographic record out, those files might be too large to ship. So then you convert to JPEG and send that off. Um, next slide, please. Yes. Um, ah, <laughs> I feel like I, I didn't have this exactly the way I wanted it, but I did want to talk about this next piece, which is storytelling. Uh, so when we uh, talked at the beginning, we talked about storytelling being about the process of making the work. And you can think about a bunch of different things. You can think about uh, stop motion. You can think about some kind of photographic series of how the work was made. And you can even think about video in, this, uh, in those cases. Uh, specifically today, I'm just going to talk about photography, but there are a lot of ways that you can do this storytelling. And again, the storytelling is not necessarily about the finished artwork as much as it is about the process that went into making the artwork to kind of give your audience a sense of, of what happened. How did this come about? And that's what the point is. So if we can go to the next slide, please. This is, uh, we can go back one. This is the uh, Black Lives Matter mural up on Capitol Hill. Uh, uh, the city was kind enough to ask me to document uh, the resurfacing and repainting of this. And so this is this comes back to a really, really fundamental reason of why it's good to document your work. This particular work that you're looking at right here does not exist anymore. There is another mural that has replaced it, but this particular work is gone. And without a record of it, there is no record. This work doesn't exist. Next slide, please. Uh, the folks that put this slide together or that put this work together, uh, uh, Vivid Matter Collective, uh, put it together in a, in a matter of hours. Uh, they, they, they just came guerrilla style and knocked it out and, and made this beautiful, beautiful mural that I, I hope uh, you got a chance to see. Uh, and then somebody made a decision to try to preserve the work and the way in which they decided to preserve it actually ended up harming it. Uh, and as a result, the work had to be scrubbed. You can see uh, where the, the materials are, the paint is starting to come up off of the, uh, off of the pavement. Next slide, please. Uh, so when I'm telling a story about, about work, I try to tell it from the beginning as best I can. And this was the beginning of that story. This was the story of the uh, original artwork being, being uh, cleaned up, being scrubbed off of the surface. And so there's some images. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, and the next few slides are just kind of showing uh, the process of the city uh, removing the artwork, right? The guys that are out there uh, just kind of grinding and, and making it come down to, uh, to uh, bare ground so that the artists, uh, you see the uh, lead artists, uh, 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 right in front of you. Oh my gosh, uh, Takiya's name just her last name just flew out of my head. But but she is the lead artist for Vivid Matter Collective, and also the um, uh, uh, artist in residence for the uh, for the pier uh, presently. So uh, so the artists were involved, and you kind of just want to have this conversation about what happened. And, and uh, next slide. And we want to have it in a variety of ways. So. Um, we're talking about telling a story. When you're talking about telling a story, you want to make sure that you're shooting from a variety of perspectives um, and that you're really trying to capture it in a very dynamic way. So as a photographer uh, who's recording the process of something happening, you want to think about, um, you know, am I looking at this from all angles so that I can really give a very holistic sense of what was happening in this process? Next slide. 
So we talked about the uh, folks that were grinding the work down. Um, I also included uh, uh, some information about how it was ultimately pressure washed. This is a truck that uh, I think delivers uh, 60,000 PSI uh, out of these little uh, water jets to just scour the paint. And uh, next slide. Right, so we're just trying to have a little bit of idea of, of what's going on here. What what went into uh, making this bare pavement, right? And so you see this uh, heavy machinery, this big equipment, uh, lots of bodies dedicated to making this happen. And you just kind of want to talk about um, that process. Next slide. Um, this was going to be my original slide uh, when I when I first did this presentation. Um, I just thought it was a great. Uh, 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 just a lesson, right? This work is literally not here anymore. It is gone. If there was no photographic record, we wouldn't know that it even existed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in particular, uh, just talking about the slide we did just look at, notice that that was shot from directly above. Um, so uh, bird's eye view, right? Uh, this is pretty much a standing up shot, but it's also kind of talking about uh, a couple of things. The fact that the pavement is bare. Uh, you also get kind of some atmosphere. So you're thinking about time of day. Um, when, as photographers, we usually talk about uh, uh, making sure that you capture the entire uh, scene, making sure that you capture details of the scene, making sure that you're framing the scene, making sure that you're considering your angles. Uh, you know, what angle are you? Are you standing up? Are you laying on the floor? Are you, you know, above or below from the side? Uh, and then we also think about time of day. So this photo was taken uh, early in the morning, right? And so it creates a little bit of atmosphere. So one of the things that you're thinking about is um, in the storytelling aspect is not strict documentation, but you're also taking into consideration uh, the feeling uh, that you're trying to convey in the shot. Next, uh, next shot, please. This is one of the artists uh, uh, contemplating uh, making this work again. And I thought it was a really important image to uh, include because it's important to talk about what is happening kind of internally to the extent that you can uh, with the artist. So this idea of just kind of sitting here and contemplating and figuring out what you're going to do. Um, and again, at that level, right? I'm not standing up. I'm not being, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm not being a lazy photographer and standing up and taking everything from standing height. I'm getting on the ground. I'm getting on a truck. I'm getting on the ladder. You know, I'm doing what I have to do to kind of tell the story as intimately as I can. Uh, next slide, please. We are uh, talking here about the artist and the city uh, uh, having conversation about how this process is going to begin. Uh, one of the really cool things that came out of uh, the tragedy of the uh, original artwork being destroyed was that the artists got opportunities to use a much higher quality product um, uh, that did not require sealing because it was actually uh, a traffic quality paint uh, that they were using. So the paint theoretically should last, I think it's five years, this should last without even having to be touched up uh, just because of the quality of the material. So uh, going back to this idea of choosing good materials to uh, uh, that are gonna be durable to make your project. But here are the artists kind of having that conversation with the city, next slide. And then especially because uh, this is a redo, right? We're doing it again. I wanted to make sure that I really talked about the fact that, you know, here we are at the beginning of this process. Here we are uh, laying down this first paint and making it happen. Uh, next slide. Uh, right here, I tried to talk about collaboration. It's something that you want to think about. Horatio talked about having a team of people, and I think he showed you slides of folks uh, glazing and, 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 and making, helping make the, the work. And you want to have that conversation photographed. You want to say who was here uh, helping out? Who pitched in? What were all the bodies uh, uh, there doing? And just kind of, uh, again, showing the process. Next slide. Uh, you want to inject a little fun into the into your conversation. Uh, a lot of these shots are 
uh, from below and down on the ground because the artwork was down on the ground. So again, you're trying to meet the story where it is and not where you want it to be. It'd be really nice to just stand up and take pictures all day, but that just doesn't convey, uh, you know, what was required to kind of make it work. Next slide, please. Uh, same idea, right? Again, I want to kind of point out that now I'm standing on a truck and looking down on somebody. I'm just trying to find different ways to have this conversation. Um, I think that uh, if I could convey one thing to you around storytelling is that is vital. It is, you're telling a story, right? And you're telling a story in pictures. Uh, the word photograph means writing with light. So you really want to think about what is the story I'm writing? Uh, you want to think about the things that you include as well as the things that you don't include. But for here, you really want to think about what are the different ways that uh, I, I can tell this story? How can I keep interest? I can't keep interest by shooting the same shot over and over. I can keep interest by varying it and changing the way in which people are allowed to look at the work. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the primer. Uh, down on the ground for the second Black Lives Matter mural. Again, the first one is gone. Like you see this one and it's up there and it's great, but it's not the first one, it's the second one. So we're glad that there was some photographic representation done of the first one. Uh, but this is the story. And so we've kind of talked you through uh, the older mural to where it has been uh, uh, stripped from the sidewalk uh, to where folks started to come in together again to do this uh, one more time. Next slide, please. Uh, th that particular shot, the Black Lives Matter shot was taken on a ladder. So you really do want to make sure that you, again, I, I just, I'm going to keep emphasizing, have access to different angles. Uh, you want to think about framing. Uh, this is an easy frame. You can see that uh, uh, Kamisha is, is framed by the doorway behind her. Uh, so you're thinking about ways in which to, uh, point to who your subject is at the time that you're shooting. Uh, and one really, really easy way to do that is with framing. Uh, framing allows you to kind of isolate your subject within the frame, uh, within the larger image uh, by, by the use of a frame. Next slide, please. Uh, again, we're talking about angles. Uh, we're talking about what does this read better if you're standing up, shooting it from the side, or does it read better if you get on the ground and talk about what it is they're actually doing? Um, I would suggest that it, it's it's much more important to talk about what it is they're actually doing. Um, and really, uh, in this storytelling aspect, take your time to tell um, a compelling story by, again, thinking about your, uh, your framing, your detail shots, your... Uh, the angles that you're choosing to use. Next slide. Uh, we're looking for a variety of different looks. I mean, you could think, boy, it's just a bunch of people painting. I uh, So you're trying as a photographer to think about different ways to convey what all is happening. And again, um, one of the things that we talk about is time of day. So the, one of the beautiful things about this particular project was just that it did stretch from the morning into the afternoon. So you've got different kinds of looks in terms of the sun uh, or lack thereof or rain or whatever. Um, but again, you're still also talking about who are the individual artists that I'm photographing and, and how do I want to represent them. Uh, in this case, I'm kind of filling the frame with the artist. You're, I, I believe you're very clear about uh, who or what the subject is. Uh, and that's achieved by getting close enough. Uh, so this, uh, I don't know if I'd call this a detail shot, but certainly getting close enough to start um, being very clear about who or what you're talking about. Next slide. Same situation here, uh, choosing a level. And, and again, when you're choosing your level, um, and I, I looked at this in different ways. I think you'll see another, another look at this uh, further on in the slides. But the idea of getting uh, intimate with your subject, I would consider this a detail shot. Um, I would think about, you know, when you think about the mural as being the overall uh, structure, you can think of these individual artists making their individual letters that they're painting uh, as detail shots. And again, trying to talk about um, what it is he's doing, right? And, and, and keep interest. Next slide, please. 
Uh, you want to do, again, every single thing you can. I, how can I talk about this? What are the ways I can do this? Can I make portraits? Can I uh, talk about people in this way? Can I talk about them in action? Uh, can I talk about the larger structure? What are all the ways that I can have this conversation? Uh, uh, this gentleman is just uh, amazing, right? Uh, just from the glasses to the hat to the red jacket, everything here uh, to me uh, talks about somebody interesting to look at and 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 compelling in terms of talking about the story. Uh, next slide, please. Same thing here. We're we're having this conversation. I think that this is this is the storytelling conversation, and not really. Uh, my mouth is moving, but I'm wanting you to look at the images uh, because I think they do tell a story, right? They talk about. Uh, the effort that went into this, they talk about the work that went into this, uh, and they talk about that again through the use of angle, uh, time of day, framing, um, and then the entire piece. Uh, next slide, please. Same idea. I'm trying to get intimate with the artists. I'm trying to meet them where they are. I'm trying to talk about what they're doing. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I talked about portrait, but uh, this is important for the sake of just uh, talking about the way the artist looks. This is portrait. This is almost to be considered environmental portraiture because uh, they are doing the thing that they do, and we are kind of representing them in that way. And that's something to think about. Like where where should this uh, uh, storytelling take place? Right. It, it certainly makes more sense to get down on the ground and talk about the storytelling here as opposed to um, uh, in some other fashion. Next slide, please. Same idea. I keep looking for different ways to talk about this thing. Um, I, I cannot stress that enough, but I think I have stressed it enough. Uh, it's so important here. Uh, what I did was take advantage of the colors that the artists were putting on the floor uh, to let the sun bounce those colors back into their faces and make for more interesting images. I also tried when I was making this work to talk about uh, energy, right? Like, how do you convey energy in a still uh, a still piece, right? How do you talk about um, uh, the vibrancy that's happening? Um, and again, that's achieved through angles, uh, through watching for motion. I think one of the things I really like about this particular uh, image is that it feels a little bit off balance. And for me, it feels like some motion. So uh, I'm trying to talk about, I'm trying to make a still photo of somebody moving and doing something and making something happen. So I'm thinking about what angles can I shoot at to uh, to deliver that sense of motion and that sense of action. Next slide, please. This is shot entirely from the top, as you can see. Uh, but it also talks about the progression of the work. Uh, it, 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 <laughs> it's simple. Uh, I think that's another thing that's really, really important in your photography is to keep it simple. Uh, you want to get clear about who your subject is or what your subject is. If you're talking specifically about the artist, talk about the artist. If you're talking specifically about the artwork, talk about the art artwork. If you're talking about both of them interacting, have that conversation, but have it as simply as possible. Uh, you're not wondering what else is going on in this photo. <laughs> you see it. It's, it's, it's there for you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is about uh, teamwork, right? This is talking about collaboration. This is talking about uh, people's ability to be comfortable uh, squatting down and making these making these shapes and doing it uh, in close proximity. So again, just trying to gather all the elements of what happened uh, in this story, in this making, talking about all the various people that came together to make the work. A lot of the artists that worked uh, on this uh, on these pieces were not the main artists. Like the, the two folks that you see depicted here were support uh, uh, folks, you know, part of the team. But you want to talk about the team as well as the uh, the uh, major artists or artists that are, are working on a project. You kind of want to make it as holistic as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think this is the last slide. Uh, and so you just get a little celebration uh, of, of the work that's done, uh, uh, the effort that was made, and, uh, you know, and the feeling of triumph and success. And again, this was taken from uh, standing on a ladder and shooting down along the street. Uh, 
I think that's what I have for you today. Uh, I think I just want to really, really encourage you to uh, make good choices in terms of uh, uh, how you're telling stories, how you're documenting your your work, and the ways in which you document them. And I can talk a lot more about files and, and, and stuff of that nature uh, if you desire. Anyway, uh, thank you guys so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Zorn, for um, sharing those powerful images and really kind of getting to the heart of public art being about storytelling and about not just what the physical end result is, but about all the steps that go into it that are all overall. Um, I, really, um, I just want to acknowledge that we are a little over time as advertised, but definitely do want to leave some time for questions. Um, within WebEx at the lower right hand of your screen, there's a Q&A function. Please, um, audience members, feel free to submit questions um, to our esteemed panelists. Um, Jason, if you want to go ahead and um, end screen share, I think we can go ahead and do that. Um, I'd like to, we have probably about five minutes for questions, but I'd like to um, kick one off maybe to Tiffany and or Horatio. I'd, I'd love for you to speak um, briefly to kind of like an ideal scenario case study of which when an artist is commissioned for a public art through the Office of Arts and Culture and is going through the design concept phase, they're thinking about what they want to do um, in terms of researching different materiality um, and that back and forth with project management staff and conservator staff. Um, Tiffany, would you want to speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah, thanks, Maya. And um, thank you, Zorn and Horatio. I, I really enjoyed that. And it's nice to see you also. Um, so I think the ideal scenario would be uh, basically, uh, I mean, f from a conservation perspective, uh, always good to have at least an initial uh, meeting with the artist during the initial design phase and also uh, to provide any support for material suggestions or questions um, or or maybe alternatives that may not be, you know, um, initially sort of present. Uh, and then ideally a, a sort of a, another review uh, sort of mid design or final final design one or the other um, to just uh, to just kind of ensure that it's something we're able to maintain and that we've got the ability to uh, maintain the aesthetic and and everything in exactly the way that the artist wants wants to wants to see it wonderful thank you wonderful um additional questions please feel free to enter those into the q a um Horatio, I would love for you to um, speak a little bit. The, you have used a lot of different materials throughout the projects that you've had. Um, like a little bit about when you come, when you're starting to come up with an idea, is it looking into the materiality of the item that is a leading um, decision maker for that, or do you really have the concept first and then have the materiality follow? Um, I would start with the concept usually. Uh, however, um, in public art, that is kind of different than studio art in that you have to keep your process open all, all along the way in the design phase and even in the fabrication stage. Because um, particularly in the design phase, uh, a material address concept it's so connected to your concept, getting the right material um, or um, having uh, challenge yourself with a different material and realize there's an even better material that can connect with your concept. So sometime when you have a proposal, you get rejected for whatever reason it is. Uh, I take it as a challenge to, for me to um, look at my concept and look at my material and see if there's a better way and there's a more suitable way to present my idea. And keeping it all open, I think that is really important. And 
part of the creativity is from keeping it open and from the collaboration with the people you're connecting with, like your structural engineer might have some other idea about material wise, or conservator can also present you with some, you know, idea and alternative and pitfall or using certain material. Um, all that could be incorporated into your concept and align with your concept. Um, so um, I think keeping your process open is really important. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Soren, a question for you. I think um, within the images that you showed, storytelling is a really important aspect of your work, especially through um, the the examples that you shared versus um, the kind of the object on its own. Can you speak a, a little bit more about like having the role of individuals interacting that maybe with beyond that example, but individuals interacting with the piece and how that kind of um, highlights aspects of ph photography? Um, <laughs> I, I think I needed to restate the question. <laughs> Uh, what did I hear? I heard you say, uh, I think I heard you say how, uh, what are, what are considerations, uh, uh with, uh, photographic considerations with people interacting with the artwork? Is that, is that accurate? I mean, tell yeah. me, cause, cause I want to <laughs> answer it properly. Uh, uh yeah, go ahead. Let me know if I, if I got that right. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that a part like that's the interesting for a group on a variety of projects, detailed shots, the people in the projects, like how that is kind of key to the aspect of the storytelling. Oh, sure. Um, uh, okay, that, that that helps me. Thank you, Maya. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the little details are what tell the story. I mean, honestly, that's, that's the story. I could line all the artists up and just take pictures of them and say, these were the artists. And then I could take pictures of the letters and say, and these are the letters. And there it is. And that really isn't anything that doesn't tell us what happened. Um, there are a lot more pictures in that series. Uh, there are pictures of just paint cans. You know, there are pictures of paint lids with the primary colors. Uh, there are pictures of other volunteers helping of children helping. There are pictures of bystanders uh, next to the art and watching the art being made. So all of these things are things that you want to think about because you again, when I uh, it is, it's holistic, right? What happened? You're not really talking about the art per se in that you're talking about how it happened and you're trying to generate interest in the story. Um, and you do that by having those, the, you know, by, by having that really good coverage of the entire environment, right? And so it, again, it's the entire space, but it's also those details and those details can be simple, right? Just a, a picture of a paintbrush to a more complex, but still intimate detail of the artist making the work or interacting with, uh, you know, a bystander. Um, yeah, that, there's no story without the details. There's no story without talking about that, those interactions and those little moments. Great, thank you. And I did just receive one more question and then we're gonna um, wrap this up. Um, when doing multimedia, mm. I'm sorry. Um, when doing multi multimedia work, what that requires software? Do you generate ideas first, or do you seek out the software first? And I think that's probably for Horatio as you. Okay. Know, <laughs> uh, uh, before I answer that, I want to add a little bit to uh, Son's answer. Is that and when you, when we come to uh, working with public art, more and more time now, I when I send in photograph about my artwork, I tend to include how people interact with the art, because I think it's about livability. Uh, you QA public artwork and people can live with it and enjoy it and interact with it. And that's speak more about your artwork than anything else. And in terms of software, um, there's so much software out there. And the main important thing is uh, really, you started with your concept and you try to convey your idea and your concept to the software people, just give them an idea what kind of effect you want to get out of your artwork. You might not know what software they need to do to make it happen, but um, if you can convey what kind of sensational, what kind of feeling, uh, even abstract or visceral, 
uh, if you can convey to your software people, uh, they can usher you and bring you into certain things that you might not be aware of. So uh, that's that's the part I would emphasize. Uh, somebody did ask a question about uh, a wall scanner, and I just kind of wanted to talk to that really, really briefly. Um, I'm not personally uh, familiar with wall scanning, but uh, and, but they asked about wall scanning versus digital photography. Uh, a digital camera is a scanner. Um, I, I don't know how else to say that. It's a scanner. The issue, uh, I think, would be one of cost. So what is the cost of doing it uh, with a digital camera? Versus, uh, or even if it's a professional coming in to do that work, what's that cost versus the cost of the wall scanner? Um, I mean, ultimately, even with the wall scanner, the issue is going to be uh, with 2D art is the sensor uh, perpendicular and parallel to the 2D artwork, which is to say, is everything aligned properly? And if wall scanning can give you perfect alignment with that and you get an image, um, it, it's still, you're still making a digital image. Right, so you would, I think at that point, you just kind of would go with cost. What is the cost of doing this? Uh, does it make sense to, to make it happen? Again, you can totally do it with your camera. You can even shoot raw on your camera. Okay, some, there's a few things that you want to kind of jump into there, but th it's all scanning. So, you know, find that good price. Um, there we are. I want to add to uh, Soren, what she said is also that when, you, uh, again, it's a collaboration when you look for a photographer to photograph your work, convey your feeling and idea you want the piece to convey. And the photographer will find it also. Uh, you can also make it a collaborative effort that photographer could see things that you might not have seen. And, and so in a collaboration way, the photographer is telling you, uh, more about the artwork than you originally envisioned. So it's, it's a, you know, it's both way, but you also should convey what you want to convey, what the photograph should convey, and then photographer will find a way to make it happen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you all so, so much for sharing your expertise, um, your great images, your artwork, um, and so much knowledge as part of this overall boot camp online. I really appreciate and want to extend a thank you to Horatio and Zorn for your participation today. Um, thank you everybody for attending. This will be available on our website, a full recording to be able to re-reference the information. As I know, um, a lot of it is pretty a lot of it is pretty detailed to be able to. Um, so thank you again um, and um, good luck and ha have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Maya.